join with me in the call of worship. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a land of suffering? We, we shall sing it for every strength of the Lord. How shall we sing the Lord's song when we feel so lonely? We shall sing in unity and faithfulness, the great association and hope. Come, let us sing the Lord's song this day. Let us praise God in all the ways of prayer. Amen. Let us continue with prayer. Generous God, it's easy for us to comfortably imagine so many other Christians praying today and receiving the elements of Holy Communion. We like to think of this as a nice event. Yet you remind us that when we have received these gifts, we are also called to use the strength that they provide to witness to others through acts of re reconciling love. This communion is not a nice service meant for our comfort, it's a challenge for us to truly accept the love of Jesus Christ, who gave to us his body and his blood, that we might be redeemed to do God's loving will. As we have gathered here this day, bringing our prayer concerns to you, O oh Lord, help us to remember that you hold each one of us gently and lovingly, offering your healing mercies. Give us courage to be your witnesses seeking peace in this war-torn world. For we ask this in the name of Jesus the Christ, who taught us, as well as his disciples, to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our Gospel lesson today comes from the 17th chapter of the Gospel according to Luke. Hear these words. And Jesus said, and if the same person sins against you seven times a day and turns back to you seven times and says, I repent, you must forgive. The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord replied, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it would obey you. Who among you would say to your slave who has just come in from plowing or tending the sheep in the field, come here at once, take your place at the table? Would you not rather say to him, prepare supper for me, put on your apron and serve me while I eat and drink, and later you may eat and drink? Do you thank the slave for doing what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were ordered to do, say, we are unworthy slaves. We have done only what we ought to have done. This is the word of God. Thanks. You know, a lot of times we talk about faith, and this particular scripture often, oftentimes puts it into a, a way of saying things that Make, make us think that we want to have a greater measure of faith than just what we have. If only I have more faith, what's going on in my life that causes me to request that? You know, Jesus was talking to the disciples and perhaps about the disciples. Okay, how many of your friends really upset because they do the same thing over and over again. Oh yes, Lord, we need more faith because you must forgive them. It's not about believing harder or being more confident in our faith. It's, it's something a little bit different. Now, I remember hearing about Helen Hayes. Do you remember Helen Hayes? Some of you remember a little bit more. Uh, Clearly, in her autobiography, she was a Broadway actress, she tells about her first attempt to cook a Thanksgiving turkey. 
And before bringing it out of the kitchen to the dining room table, she announced her husband and son, Now you know this is the first turkey that I've ever cooked. If it isn't any good, I don't want anybody to say a word. We'll just get up from the table without comment and go to a restaurant and eat. She then went back into the kitchen to get the tray, and when she came into the dining room with the turkey, she found her husband and her son seated at the table with their coats, hats, and gloves on. <laughs> ready to go out to eat. They really didn't have a whole lot of, it, of faith in her ability to cook, especially a turkey. So what is faith really about? And we talk about being saved by faith, not by works. We, we talk about what it is to live by faith. And what does that really mean? Well, the Bible uses faith in uh, a number of different ways, but Latin has trimmed it down to four different definitions. One uh, definition of that is uh, the word is census, which sounds pretty much like assent or agreeing, and that, that's pretty much what it is. It's a head event. It, it's something that you agree to. It, it's mental. And the opposite of that might be doubt or disbelief. Well, there's a second one that's, the second meaning of that, and that's fiducia. That's kind of like radical trust. Bankers often use that. And you know bankers, right? They want fiduciary trust for your money. So that means that we get to relax now and trust the bank to hold on to our money and give it back to us when we need it. The same kind of trust as, you're, if any of you ever tried to teach your kids how to swim? No? What I found is that when you try to teach them to swim, you have to hold your arms under them while they're laying flat and they feel your arms or hands underneath their body and, and they at some point learn to trust the buoyancy of the water. And when they finally trust that buoyancy of the water, that's the fiducia that we're talking about. Learning to trust God radically. The opposite of that might be worry or, or anxiety. But then there's a third meaning. It's called fidelitas. You know, fidelity is the word we get from that. Faithfulness, it's the opposite of idolatry. It's something that we use in marriage ceremonies a lot, talking about loyalty. And we talk about loyalty to Jesus as our Lord instead of nationalism or affluence or achievement or family or desire. We even use it in the uh, Marine Corps. You've heard that term, Semper Fi, but Semper Fidelis. Now you know that Marines are always faithful, but you also realize that Marines just sit back and don't do anything, right? Marines are active with their fidelity. They are out there and making sure that that fidelity is put to the task. Well, there's a fourth one that's called Visio. And that, actually it's called the, it's a way of seeing the world. What is, what is reality? We, we can see it in three different ways. One is hostile reality where, where we think everybody's out to get us. You know, we put that in religion pockets. Unless we offer the right sacrifices or the right prayers or the right behaviors, Jesus is going to come down and get us. Or there's a second way of looking at the world. It's kind of like an indifferent reality, thinking that, you know, God is, doesn't really care about us anymore. He's not going to inter intervene any longer. It's neither hostile nor supportive. But it's all up to us what happens in this world. That kind of makes it like being self-centered. Then there's a third way, and that's more like a nourishing reality. It's life-giving, it's filled with wonder and beauty, and it's 
It's a way of looking at the world where you see God loving us and caring about us. Even the birds of the air and the flowers of the field that we hear about in the, in the Gospels. It gives us freedom and joy and peace. So the faith that Jesus talks about most often is those last three. And they are all relational. They have very little to do with just mental agreements. It's not a statement of faith, it's, it's getting to know God and what God does. If the same person sins against you seven times a day and turns back to you seven times and says, I repent, you must forgive, Jesus says. No wonder the disciples cry out, increase our faith. Because Jesus is asking us to do something more than any normal being would be expected to do. If a person sins against me or treats me badly, sticks it to me seven times in a row, and seven times in a row they say I'm sorry, Jesus is expecting me to forgive them. Even that jerk that I'm a friend with. Enough is enough, they say. I want to know when it's going to stop. And yet Jesus says forgive, and so the disciples cry out, increase our faith. We can't do this. And it's that gap between what Jesus asks us to do and our ability to do it. That's what is really enormous. And that's pretty much the point of this lesson today. We're thinking of faith as something human, something that we do. Some especially intense sort of believing or, or really positive, focused thinking that results in good things happening to us and to our friends. We think of faith from the human point of view, and, and Jesus is thinking about faith from God's side of things. See, faith is a gift of God. Not something that we can create. Not something that we can imagine. But Jesus carefully reminds them that in the life of faith, it's not the believer who performs the act of power or receives the praise for it. Both the act and the credit belong to God. And if we perform our acts of love and service to God out of a desire to earn praise on earth in this life or a secure spot in heaven in the next, we're missing the point. Not only is this parable about life, but it's also about faith. See, there is nothing that we can do to earn God's love. God's love has been ours since, the, since before we were born. It washes over us every day. It's unbidden. It's unearned. It fills our lives. It melts our hearts. softens our eyes. It tenderizes our spirits. And it turns us away from our preoccupation with ourselves. It turns us into a fascination of loving and caring of Christ. Jesus has put people in our path so that we can emulate him. The reality is this, that we have all the faith that we need to do great things for God. Or to be more correct, we have all the faith we need to allow God to do great things in, with, and through us. And that's what that parable is telling us. The story reminds, of, reminds us of our place and how easy it is to exchange roles. God is God and we are God's creatures, no more and no less. But sometimes that order can get reversed. Think of Adam and Eve. I mean, dominion over the earth is a really heady kind of challenge. Why stop there, the serpent says. You'll be like God's. Or we think of Jesus as the one who washes feet, forgives sins, hears prayers, supplies needs, and pretty soon we come to expect that Jesus is the only one that does that. I remember my grandmother visiting her after a long trip, a friend of mine and I came back from California. We're driving through Colorado, and we 
we knew we wanted to stop in Steamboat Springs to see my grandmother, and so we did. And we had called in advance, of course, not my cell phone, you know, that was too, too far back there. But we called her and said, we're going to stop in just to visit with you. And what do you think she did? She got up early. She made us breakfast and lunch. And was there ready for us when we drove in at 6 in the morning. She didn't have to do that. We said, thank you. I said, oh, no thanks, that is something that I do. That's what I do. That's what the slave is doing too. Just what is necessary. Jesus is reminding us that the true kingdom, power, and glory belong to God. And any wishful thinking on our part that if God would just give us more faith, we'd be able to do more things for God, then this is the point entirely. The our calling this day is to humbly ask God to increase not our faith, but our willingness to be used by God in whatever way God chooses. Our challenge today is to open up our lives to the leading of God's Spirit, to allow that holy wind to blow us about in God's world, touching down to serve wherever God wills it, with whomever God places in our path, just to be disciples. And that's good news. See, our call to discipleship does not rest upon our fitness, it rests upon forgiveness, and that forgiveness comes from God. Our call to discipleship does not rest upon our achievement, it rests upon grace, and that grace comes from God. Our call to discipleship does not rest upon our success. It rests upon faithful trust in Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and Master. And that is good news indeed. That's the advantage of having a Lord. Amen. As God has poured out God's love on us, let us now go in peace to bring God's love to all people. Rest in the confidence of God's abiding presence with us and be joyful in our service to God. So let us go in peace and love. In the name of Jesus, amen.